The notions of productivity that are still being packaged and sold today have their roots in the Industrial Revolution. They're about maximizing the productivity of machines, making humans, making it possible for humans to maximize machine productivity. But we're, we're post-Industrial Revolution, and as the world changes, we need to look at the human, and what we want to get to is the human understanding and managing her own energy and how she does that. Yes. Hi. Hello, Granny. Hello, LinkedIn. We are thrilled to be hosting Granny Rana. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's such a pleasure to have you with us again. This time, we are talking about productivity. For our LinkedIn members, I hope you can see Lucia, who is going to be fascinating us with her artistry. Hi, Lucia. Are you ready for today's live? Sure. <laughs> Great. Let's get the show on the road, Granny. If you're ready, I'm, I'm ready. ready. Let's do this then, because we're I obviously talking about something that I care about a lot, which is productivity, energy. How how do I get more stuff done in in my day? If I could be able to rent an hour or two of someone else's hours, I probably would be <laughs> one of those people who would do it. But I can't, which now leaves me with the option of uh, absorbing as much as I can from leaders who talk about how to get more done, how to be productive and all that good stuff. And it's very interesting because one of the things that you've made me keenly aware of is that a lot of the information that we have so far around productivity and getting a lot done has actually come from the male species. It's very male focused. <laughs> And when you said that to me the first time, I have to admit there was a light bulb that just went on in my head <laughs> because I finally, for the first time, I don't know why it had never occurred to me, but for the first time I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense, which is why their ideologies or their concepts or even their advice works until it doesn't every single month it works. You know, I am with that guy. I am like grinding it out and then something happens and it all falls apart. <laughs> and I'm like, I've got to figure this out for myself. But it wasn't, it wasn't intentionally or consciously part of my everyday thinking. But I do think that at some point, maybe like in the last five years or so, I have come to realize that I have to pace myself. I call it pacing myself. I have to pace myself and be okay with pacing myself at certain times of the month, right? And it was a very interesting conversation then when you brought it up. And I, and I think you even remember, we did have a conversation a while back where we talked a little bit about menstrual cycles and, and menopause and we touched on it just as like a, a starter. And it was like so cool for me to find out that I'm not the only woman who has dips because 30 days in a month, I do not have all days consistently equal in terms of my energy, no matter how much I take care of myself. But I had never heard another woman openly say that. So it was very cool when we had that conversation. But I think it's even more cool in today's conversation that we're about to have, because you're bringing us not just the idea or the suggestion that productivity as it is being promoted and taught right now is broken, uh, especially for women. But really, it's broken probably for everyone because the, the original concept just doesn't work in uh, the landscape that we work and live in now. So I'm very eager to hear how you're seeing it, what you're learning, uh, what you're seeing needs to change now, how your journey was versus how you're seeing the younger women, the ambitious young women that are coming up now should deal with this. And I look forward to gathering as much insights as I can today and hopefully applying it for myself as well, because like I said, I need more hours in my day. So Granny, please tell us. <laughs> Don't we all? How um, are you seeing productivity? What is the difference? Okay. What's wrong? What's broken? But let me start with where you started, and then I want to go back and look at how our notions of productivity were formed. Um, it turns out, 
I look at things uh, as someone who's built a startup, advised startups. I'm a business person at heart. Uh, and let me say before anybody uh, comes at me with an ax, I really love men. I'm married to a man. My best friend is a man. I, I love people however they identify. And men have hormones too. But, and what I saw was there's a sector exploding, ex exploding growth called femtech, femtech. And it's really about helping women keep track of their cycle, helping women who are entering menopause keep track of what's going on with them. And it's like, um, there are all these biometric apps now, like Apple has a track, Fitbit, there are all these apps, and now the apps are starting um, to include what's going on with a woman so who has a, a hormonal cycle. Now that excludes women who are taking birth control pills, women who are postmenopausal, et cetera, but it does include a lot of working women. And so in the menstrual cycle, there are four phases that I won't go, go into. There's a theory called cycle syncing, uh, which you can look up if you're a woman and you're interested in that. And basically it talks about the different kinds of energy that are available to you at different times of the month. So to use you as an example, Jeanette, um, you may not be able to push your energy at certain times in the month, but it may be a great time for you to reflect. And it may be that your creative energy is high. So as long as the focus is on go, 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 focus, 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 focus. That ignores not just women's hormonal ryth rhythms, but everybody's. Everybody has, as another example, circadian rhythms. You know, some of us are uh, the kind who wake up with the sun. Some of us are better at night. We try to adapt our circadian rhythms to the workplace instead of the workplace to us. And so it's not just old people who need a nap at two o'clock in the afternoon. There are a lot of friends working now in the workplace who really need to stop between two and 2.30. The father of productivity is Frederick Taylor who wrote a book in 1911. And basically he was considered a scientist and he wrote about time management. And, it, and his ideas were central to Henry Ford who was the one who figured out in a major way, the first production line to mass produce automobiles. Very cool. But think about this for a minute. This is basically how do you get humans to behave in a way that works for the machine? Yes, does that, are you feeling it, Jeanette? Lucia, Absolutely. give me an amen. Okay, amen. so, amen. So now we have the father of time management. And that goes on for a while. And then we have Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker is um, comes along mid-century. I mean, I, I'm so old, I remember Peter Drucker's writing. And he was a god. And he introduced the ideas of um, management science. And basically the idea was how do you get your workers to do more? So remember, this is still about work. And this is still about somebody else managing me as a worker to get me to do more. So productivity is all about how to get me to behave so someone else can maximize their profit. I know I sound like a communist here and I'm not. I've worked on Wall Street. I'm a card carrying capitalist. But the reality is productivity was geared toward how do you get humans to spend less time, work harder so profit goes up. Now. Then we come to Andy Grove and sort of the Silicon Valley period of understanding productivity. And that's really kind of the same set of concepts you got from the productivity grandfathers. And it's like about high output management. So Andy Grove is also, you know, these are the three gods of productivity. He's talking about how do you get, how do you manage a workforce in such a way that overall the output goes up? And mostly they were talking about production of things, widgets or guns or whatever, because the ideas of productivity have also been very big in the military. And that is all good. I'm not against any of that. I think it's fabulous. And it's not 21st century. 
So what we're looking at now is a world in which it's not um, machines producing widgets, it's AI, which is here, right? Which can do a lot of the grunt work for us. It's a world in which not as many of us are going to the office, right? It's a world, even on LinkedIn, where work and personal are blending. And it's a world when it's okay to talk about oneself as an individual. And what I am finding is for Gen Z and even younger, what, what the discussion about being authentic at work is and bringing your authentic self to work is actually about um, emotions and energy as well as getting things done. I'm gonna pause. Jeanette, is that clear? Is that working for you, Lucia? Does that oh, yeah. sound right? Absolutely. I'm, I'm like, I'm definitely loving this because first of all, what you're having us recognize is that this is not about shaming any one particular concept. It's more about recognizing that as we evolve, we also want to start evolving some of the habits, some of the tools, some of the ways of existing that we've become too familiarized with that may actually not be serving us right now. Secrets for women, but they really do apply to anyone who wants to have uh, a life that they feel is worthy of them. Yes, and so I'm not rejecting productivity today. today. What I'm saying is we're ready to, to take that and go to another level, right? Just like and we're evolving our technology because we are we seem to be so good at producing better iPhones, better smartphones. Uh, you know, we're now up to what? Apple 15 is almost coming out. Like we're, we obviously understand the value of co co constant evolution with our technologies. And I think what you're trying to say here is, are we looking at also how we are running ourselves, right? Yes. Yes, how we are maximizing our energy to get what we want from our life. That, that's how I'm defining productivity today. I have, I, you know, I use AI a lot and I ask chat, how many waking hours does a 20 year old person on average have in their lifetime? That's an intense question, right? So yeah. it's somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 hours in a lifetime that a 20 year old can expect to be awake. That's what, that's what my beloved youngins have to work with. And then the question is, how do I use time is my finite resource? Yes. How do I maximize my return on the energy I spend in any moment of time? So that's why I'm really into a personal ROI. I'm investing my time in something, right? Am I getting the maximum return on that for myself? That doesn't mean that I'm not investing in uh, working hard for the company because I will be getting a return for that in terms of you know salary, benefits, et cetera. That's worth it. But it's also about staying conscious of where am I putting my energy? Is the return what I want? And things I things like, um, what is my power source? What is my physical power source? What is my consciousness power source? Where am I spending my energy? And where are my energy leaks, right? If I, to use a plumbing analogy, uh, you know, if there's a pipe that's leaking, then eventually that's going to be a problem. We have energy leaks too. And so the idea of looking at productivity from the person out instead of from the business challenge in is that we look at how we perform. We look at how we perform for ourselves. And I think it's particularly critical now because of AI. You know, I'm reading all these things and hearing all these things about you know, AI will be the masters and we will be the slaves, you know, in a young person's lifetime. No, that is not true if we invest our energy. All of the articles about, you know, the planet's going to hell and humans are going to die. No, not if we invest our energy correctly. The problems that consume one as an individual can be addressed 
in the time we each have given on this planet if we can focus our intention and put our energy behind that intention. And what I see um, when I look at YouTube, I love, trust me, I listen to so many YouTube videos on productivity and the guys are all, you know, like they're neuroscientists and they're doctors and they have scientific methods and it's so clean and it's so beautiful. And I think, yes, yes, yes. And then I think things like, well, when do they do the laundry, right? <laughs> and do any of them have to deal with what day? You know, is there a day when in order to get what they want from the world, they have to deal with their hair? I don't think so. <laughs> and so there are all these questions that are isolated from productivity about self-care, to some degree, the biometrics, stress management, that are really all part of this one question of our own energy budgets. How do we invest our energy? How do we understand how we're investing our energy? And how do we figure out what the return is? And I'm on fire. I'm on fire. I am fire. You're on fire. You are, you are a woman on fire, Granny. There is no doubt. And let me tell you, <laughs> Lucia, that is hot. I absolutely love the fact that you have Granny doing her hair. <laughs> but that is so good because you're right, Granny. Like I've never seen any productivity guru uh, talk about laundry day or hair no. day <laughs> or hair day. No, no. And, you know, they're all, you know, they're really pretty much without exception, great looking men. You they know, are. I am and very well groomed uh, and enthusiastic heterosexual. And I, you know, they're eye candy, right? Mm -hmm. I love looking at them. They're all gorgeous. And uh, I'm intoxicated when they talk about focus, 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 focus. And then the focus. phone rings. Yep. And it's one of my friends who has Alzheimer's and I know she needs me, right? Yeah. So yeah. for me, relationships are a priority. I invest my energy in that because helping her gives me a return of um, soul energy, psychic energy, whatever you want to call it. They call the things that I care about in life distractions. Oh, <laughs> I, I love right? this. Wait, let's sit here for a minute. So return on invest my personal return on investment my personal ROI it's such a good term where do you draw the line between a distraction like you say most people think is a distraction and something that is actually giving me energy ROI and and as you think about that Tell me where self-care falls into this. Would that be considered a distraction? The fact that I do want to make my hair, I do want to groove myself, and that does require time. Okay, so let me work backward from what you just said. Uh, the point is uh, energy management, and you are the expert. So uh, on our foundation of productivity, it was scientific management, and they were the expert. You are the expert in you. You are the expert in you. So we need tools that, that help you be conscious of and look at your return. Um, if you spend time on your hair and your appearance, there's a great return because uh, how you present to the world influences what the world gives you. If Kim Kardashian didn't invest so much time and energy in her appearance, would she get a return? No, I don't think so. Uh uh, you think about Dolly Parton. Who, Do you think Dolly right, Parton would Parton still be back? relevant if she didn't look the way she does? No, but none of us would be. If you are scrolling, right, and you're scrolling, 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 you automatically will be looking at whatever is attractive to you, which is different for everyone, right? I mean, I scroll and I look at dogs sometimes, but <laughs> if you Whatever you choose to look at, you're looking at a presentation of self that has energy put into it. And if you think about the massive influencers, the massive influencers, what we would call self-care is their investment and in how they present themselves. So we say that we care about authenticity and we do uh, in social media, but 
That doesn't mean authenticity without some investment in projecting my value to you, right? In shaping how you experience me. And so uh, the things that are calculated as self-care are actually on the business side, big businesses because women who invest in self-care have ideas in mind about what that's gonna do. If I'm uh, looking for a date, which I am not because I'm so happy with pop-ups, but let's say I'm on old person's, <laughs> an old person's dating site. Am I going to put up a photo where I look nasty? No, right? If I'm a guy, any kind of guy, identify as guy, straight guy, not straight guy, non-binary, whatever the hell, you know, whatever my images that I put out there, I'm probably investing in it because the return I want is a big enough pool that I can pick who I want to hook up with, be with, marry, whatever it is I want. And so I think that self-care actually, um, if you are conscious about how you're investing your energy, really underneath has some kind of marketing purpose and could be a reasonable expense when you're looking at your return on investment, right? It's worth that time um, to you if your goal is to have a certain kind of connection or to have the world experience you in a specific way. So it's not a distraction. It's not wasting time. It's actually an investment. You draw the line. So what uh, we're working on now is a way to do energy budgeting so that you can start looking at where you spend your energy, you know, on a given day, and then what you get from it. And if at the end of, you know, a quarter, you see that, maybe it's not worth it to go to the nail salon every two weeks. I will use myself as an example because that's all I have. When I first started doing social media because I'd wave my hands a lot, I went and spent uh, time every two weeks to get powder dip nails. And they were so beautiful, right? Except they were expensive and it took a lot of time and it took time to get there and to get back. And when I had to take them off, it turned out they had damaged my nails. So for me, the return on investment was too high, except there are always alternatives. I was uh, talking to another woman about this saying, I don't know what to do. I use my hands and what do I do about my nails? And she said, press on nails, honey. So for me, uh, I will experiment with press on nails. It's not drawing the line. It's can I spend less energy on this because my return on energy invested in my nails as it was, was not worth it to me. We each make the decision of, is it worth it or is it not? I talk I to people it. about, um, you know, coloring their hair, right? Obviously, I quit coloring my hair a long time ago. And when I talk to people about coloring their hair, it's like, is it worth it? I have a friend who dyes her hair, has keratin treatments and blows out her hair because she likes that look, right? That's a lot of time and money invested in presenting the way she wants to present. I used to do that. I used to have a double process color, a base color, highlights, you know, my hair keratin so that I could blow it out. And then it was like, I could buy a small appliance for what I'm spending on my hair. And that doesn't even include the amount of time it takes to blow it out or all the products I need to use to do it, which are probably not healthy for me. So this uh, process of thinking about energy management return on energy, the return on investment of energy and an energy budget is a way for you to know and to be reflective about, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? And so for me, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. And I grew my hair out and went through the pain of going gray before it was kind of chic, the pain to my self-esteem, the pain to how other people saw me. I think it took, it cost me money in the marketplace because people see gray hair and they think you're older. So I became um, TFO, too old, and you can figure out what the F stands for, to be hired as an employee doing the kind of work I do. So there was expense to growing it out. And yet uh, that expense was worth it to me because it freed me up to find a way to invest my energy and get a great return on my terms for my body, for me. So part of what this is about is saying, Yes, there are scientific management principles, which of course 
ultimately are not because they're about humans and you know who knows about us nobody understands the difference between the brain and consciousness and there are lots of things we don't know yet so it's basically you you my linkedin watcher viewer you are the expert in you and what you need are the resources it takes for you to do your job which is to be um, the CEO and CFO of your energy budget, which means setting out a vision, having a plan, and then with your CFO hat on reporting to your internal CEO and saying, you know what, maybe I could have done more here. Maybe I could have gotten better results here. In this category, uh, I kind of fell down on investing and I want to do more. That's brilliant. Okay, so we need to have not just financial budgets uh, if we want financial freedom, but we also need to have energy budgets. Yes, and that makes it sound cumbersome, but what I, I'll say two things. One, I had dinner with a 13 year old the other night, uh, smart girl, and I said, how do you, what do you use to keep track of your life? You know, I talked to her about how interested I was in how do, uh, people keep track of their days and what they're doing. And it turns out that she uses um, a journal to keep track of her emotions and her energy. She uses an app to keep track of her to-dos. She uses an app to keep track of her biometrics, like is she exercising, is she drinking water? And then there was another uh, physical app that I don't remember. So it was three apps and an analog solution to try to keep track of what's up with her. <laughs> it's insane, and yet we all have that. I bet most of the LinkedIn viewers looking at this have at least an app that tells them how many steps, how much exercise, how was their sleep quality, right? And I bet that everyone looks, looking at this has some kind of to-do list. You know, they have to-do list or some kind of other to-do thing. And I bet a lot of people looking at this have a journal but they don't have a way to pull it together. So I'm not talking about adding another to do, I'm talking about funneling everything we already do into a different mental framework that will help us understand and maximize the energy in the days we have. It's really interesting that you say this, Granny, because to, to some degree, I'm hearing you echo the, the very ideas that we're seeing a lot more now uh, in terms of data centralization and creating ecosystems because we know that they make doing business more efficient that having that uh, data visibility actually helps you uh, improve the business overall especially if you want to keep growing and the idea that we have so much scattered data around for different functions within a, a business actually complicates rather than help drive the kind of efficiency that we were hoping for when we first started this whole idea of uh, you know, using data, storing data, gathering data. And what you're saying is we are now at the point where it's becoming normal for us to, to recognize that it's good for us to keep track of our activities, of what we do, what we are meant to do, of our lives as a whole how much we exercise, how much water we drink, how much we sleep, the quality of the sleep. Like we're starting to understand these things matter, but it's all very scattered. And in the case of a woman, especially, it's um, fragmented because until it integrates with me as a woman and the fact that I go through cycles, I go through hormonal shifts and every month is different. If it doesn't integrate with that, then it's still quite inefficient and it's not the best use of what we call productivity. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it is. And also it's not sustainable. It's not so sustain sustainability, obviously. right? Is a big trend in business and for young people, we want yeah. things that are sustainable. And yeah. so there's recognition that, um, you know, the mindset that you were talking about so beautifully at first of, you know, do, 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 I need another hour. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe right? not. And yes. Maybe not. And the other thing is that it's uh, the productivity um, sort of, it assumes that everyone 
is abled, able-bodied, that we're all able, which leaves out everybody with chronic illnesses, as an example. You know, there, there are menstrual cycles, but I know a lot of people who have different chronic illnesses that they have to work around, right? Yes. It's, our bodies are all different. And yes. it leaves out people who have different kinds of mental health challenges right. where, you know, Absolutely. those create challenges. And yeah. it also uh, doesn't recognize basic other things about uh, hormonal cycles that all humans have, like cortisol. Ooh, we release yeah. a lot of cortisol when we get stressed. So yeah. there are diet plans that say you need to lower your cortisol level because that's causing belly fat. Well, yeah. And <laughs> do I really need another app? Am I not just one human? So yeah. that if I have, you know, like a, a an eating plan on top of all these other plans, I'm overwhelmed with numbers, which is why business is always on a quest to your point, Jeanette, of how do businesses uh, get their measurements right? What is easy to measure is usually not what is important. I'm really yes. taking John Doerr, the legendary venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, um, is big on and is written about measure what matters. And that's fabulous. And are we doing that at the personal level? If we're only measuring our steps, right? And that's what we can look back on. And we're trying to manage our emotional selves in all these different ways. And we're not paying attention to all the hormones flooding through us that we're trying to manage. And we've got these, it's like, you know, the blind men and the elephant. Yeah. <laughs> exactly to your point. We've got all these information streams coming into our brain and we don't have a framework for coordinating them. And, and they the don't give us this, any real insights because it's not, it just can't give me insights into then why is my, out, my output this month like this? Because I just have bits and pieces. This is really cool stuff. This is the, that's why so, I said the stuff they don't teach you at seminars. <laughs> no, no, no. I went to a, a, a fancy program at Harvard Business School and I loved it, right? I loved it and I learned so much. But that was in the late 90s and the measurements were all, there were a lot of numbers, as you were saying. There were a lot of numbers and the emphasis was on Really, it was management science and, you know, how do you get X results from people? Except uh, there was very little, even though I got taught leadership by John Cotter, who is brilliant and legendary. And it was case studies and talking about CEOs who built great businesses. It still didn't reach down to a human level. And I can remember... The one case study we had about a woman, this was a long time ago, no disrespect to John Cotter or Harvard Business School, I'm grateful uh, and loving to both of them. And if I have money, I give it to them. But the one case study about a woman was Mary Kay Cosmetics. And uh, they talked about the fact that she motivated her sales force by giving the winners of given contest pink Cadillacs. So if you sold a lot, you got a pink catalog black and you got to cross the stage dressed up in a full face of makeup while all of your peers applauded you. That, <laughs> wow. I thought, oh my God, that's brilliant. Except there were only six women in the class and I was the only one who was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Now today we get it. You look at, you look at some of the women owned businesses that have scaled in the beauty sector. Start with Estee Lauder. Uh, herself, and then go to, I've forgotten her name, the woman who founded uh, Glossier, right? So it's basically saying, how do I connect emotionally? How do I connect emotionally with my uh, client who is in fact my partner in what is beyond a product? And I know I sound like I've come from uh, psycho land. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, meaning to do that. But there is in fact something we can't quantify, which is an energy exchange. Let's say you're going through a drive through and uh, you put in your order and you get your stuff. It feels better when both of you are like, have a great day and the person means it. And you say, yeah, you too, thank you. Then um, 
having to wait in line, getting to the window and them giving your stuff to you and just wanting you to get out of there, right? Just like a tiny, tiny energy drain, but it's like, ah, I went out of here. So the experiences we have shape our decisions. Yesterday, um, I changed dermatologists and Pop-Pop said, I want to go to your dermatologist. And I said, okay, why? Because that's a purchase decision, right? The dermatologist is billing for his, her, their time. And I said, what made you want to change? Because I'm interested in how we behave in the marketplace. And he said, I don't like my dermatologist. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, I had to wait 45 minutes. So that we know and we can measure. And he said, but then I got in there and she looked at me carefully, but she didn't remember me. And I could tell she didn't care about me and there was no connection. It really didn't matter to her what was going on with me. That kind of subtle exchange is something we can't measure, but it makes a huge difference in the marketplace. Beautiful. So as we are coming to a close on this, I know we could go on and on about this topic, but give us one or two takeaways that you want us to at least reflect on or explore deeper as a result of today's talk. At first, I'm asking all of you to stop beating yourself up about needing two more days, not getting everything done. Um, that is not true. You're getting done what's important to you. And so what I'm suggesting is maybe it's time to shift your framework. What if you start looking at how you use your energy and the choices you make in a different way? And what if you accept that you're the expert and that it's also your responsibility to budget your energy, not only your time, which is pretty easy to write in a planner, you know, eight to nine, be creative, but how do you budget your energy so that you can get the things in your life that you care about, not that you're supposed to care about. I actually would suggest that maximizing our own energy ROI drives everything else in our life. That as we get better at that, results in every area will improve. That's like a guarantee. So the big secret is to get better at understanding how we are spending or rather investing our energy on any given day, both at work and at home, in all the activities that we do, and then to try and um, figure out a way of integrating a lot more data into our lives so we can understand what needs to improve before we start tackling external things like I probably need more skills. I probably, um, I probably need to attend more seminars. I probably need one more app <laughs> before we, we, we take that mm -hmm. approach to boosting productivity or increasing our energy, or even, you know, I probably need more supplements or, or, um, energy boosters. It's more about understanding that we have an energy budget and if we're not aware and in control of it then performance will always suffer exactly and and uh i would love responses to this because it's you know just a brand new green shoot of an idea uh that i'm putting out there and one of the things we can talk about is energy sources what gives us energy that's a whole live stream in itself that we can start working on and noticing. You know, like you were just talking about spending energy. You wish you had more energy, right? You were expressing that. How do you find that? How do you get conscious of cultivating energy? Because when you're, when you're creating a budget, you start with what do I have to spend before you spend it, right? So it would be fun if there's support for it to do a live stream about where does energy come from? Where does your, where does, you know, one's own, where does your energy come from? And how do you get more of that uh, on an hourly, daily, monthly, quarterly basis? Beautiful. Yes, I'm looking forward to that live. I'm sure it's going to happen. And I cannot wait for us to have that conversation and hear everything you have to say, Granny. However, before we end our live today, a big shout out to Lucia, who has just done an incredible job, like throughout this session, she has just been dropping them 
And it's incredible for me to see this last one because I, you know, I sometimes still have a hard time believing that she's just creating this off the fly just by listening to us because how she's able to interpret different voices, different ideas, conversations that, cause we're not, we're like, we're not moving um, at a slow pace. We're not intentionally speaking slowly or taking this conversation slower so that she can keep up with us. Sometimes we forget, I, I forget she's there. I bet you do granny. And then I see what she's coming up with. I'm like, how are you doing it this way? It's just, it's really beautiful. And I'm so, I really feel very blessed that we have Lucia with us in this series. And if you are watching this and you do want to get in touch with Lucia, please reach out on LinkedIn because we would be happy to give you an intro. This woman is magnificent, if I do say so myself. And I really hope that she will join us for the next live as well. What do you think, Granny? I think, I think that's perfect. And I will add that um, the three of us represent uh, what we can talk about later, which is three of the three of us have energy. And yet by being, uh, choosing each other to be teammates, our energy is incremental, incrementally boosted. So yes. Lucia is a world-class star. Ooh. Jeanette, you are a world-class star. I'm a wannabe you world-class world star. Class star. <laughs> and, and together we can create something for the world that is better than we could do alone. It's Agreed. so great. Agreed. That is called Women on Fire. And you know what? So something else I'm going to say, and then we're done. We're really done. <laughs> I'm going to say this. I feel like when you are, uh, when you were talking about energy budgeting, I, 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 I definitely, it resonates with me so much, but I've also learned that you can sometimes be in the presence of people who have really good energy that somehow that kind of boosts your own energy. Like you just be in the presence of people who have amazing energy to the point where it almost like, be, be, it amplifies your own energy so you end up coming out of that experience or that um event feeling more energized and i think the opposite is also true that if you uh aren't intentional with how you spend your energy or where you spend your energy and with whom you could actually come out of an experience and feel very drained and you might think that it has yeah. a lot to do with um external factors, but I, I think it has more to do with what you were just talking about. It's understanding that connection and emotions and, uh, and developing a connection amongst the people you're with to be able to amplify energy. And I, I feel like there's almost like a third one, kind of like how in, if, you, if you listen to a lot of personal development gurus, they talk about the mastermind effect where uh, having several minds together kind of benefits everyone. Could it be that the same thing happens as well in the context of energy? Yes, and uh, we'll talk next time about the difference between the impact of group intelligence that's positive and the impact of group intelligence that's negative, that's on the wrong path. So that can lead to a mob, right? To a mob effect and to bad things. So. Intention comes into that, to this. If your intention is shared and your intention is positive, being with people who are aligned to your intention, who give you power, will rev you up. I'll get off this call and run around the house like a little mechanical car for a while because there's so much flooding me right now. And the same thing about uh, what I call and a lot of people call energy vampires, which we can talk about later where you have to their energy sucks you down. And uh, that requires being a little bit of a tough nut and managing your energy by saying, you know what, I can't afford to engage with them today. This is not a good day for me to engage with them. I have to cut that short. So all of this is, is sort of together and it's messy and it's beautiful and it's hard because it's life. Well said, a great way for us to end. And I'm so grateful once again for everyone who watched this, for you, Granny, and definitely for Lucia for gracing us with her, her energy, a very silent energy that is quite profound nonetheless. But until next live, I say ciao. Bye, Lingsia. Ciao, ciao.